Vesumus omnipotens Deus, vota humili hum respice, atque a defensionem nostram, dexteram tue maestatis extende, per dominum nostrum Iesum Christum filium tuum, qui tecum vivet et reniat in unitate Spiritus Sancti Deus, per omnia secula seculorum. Amen. Lexio Epistolae Beati Pali Apostoli ad Ephesios. Fratres, estote imitatores Dei, sicut fili i carissimi, et ambulate in dilexione, sicut et Christus dilexit nos, et tradidit semid ipsum pro nobis oblationem, et hostiam Deo in odorem suavitatis. Fornicatio autem, et omnis immunditia aut avaritia, nec nominator in vobis, sicut decet santos, aut torpitudo, aut stutiloquium, aut scorilitas, que adrem non pertinet, sed magis gratiarum axio. Hoc enim citote intelligentes, quod omnis fornicator, aut immundus, aut avarus, quod est idolorum servitus, non habet hereditatem in regno Christi et Dei. Nemo vos seducat in anibus verbis, propter heic eni venit ira Dei in filios diffidentiae. Nolite ergo effici participes eorum, errati senim aliquando tenebre, nunc altem lux in domino. Ut filii lucis ambulate, fructus enim lucis est, in omni bonitate, et justitia, et veritate. Thank you. 
Sequentia Sancti Evangelii secondo Luca. In il tempore erat Jesus seiciens demonium et illud erat mutum. Et cum eici set demonium, locutus est mutus, et admirate sunt orbe. Quidem altem ex eistic serunt, en be elzebo principe demoniorum, eici demonia. Et alii tentantes signum de celo querebant habeo. Ipse altem ut vidit cogitatione seorum, dixit eis, Omne regnum in se ipsum divisum desolabitor, et domus supra domum cadet. Si altem et satanas in se ipsum divisus est, quomodo stabit regnum eius. Qui edicitis in be elzebub me eicere demonia, si altem ego in be elzebub eicio demonia, Fili vestri in quo eici hund. Ideo ipsi judices vestri erund. Poros si indigito dei eicio demonia. Profecto pervenit in vos regnum dei. Cum fortis armatus custodit atrium suum. In pace sunt ea que possidet. Si altem fortior eo. Superveniens vicerit eum, universa arma eius auferet, in quibus confidebat, et spolia eius distribuet. Qui non est mecum contra me est, et qui non colligit mecum dispergit. Cum imundus spiritus exierit de homine, ambulat per local in aquosa, Querens requiem et non inveniens dicit, revertar in domum meum unde exivi, et cum venerit invenit eam scopis mandatam et ornatam, tung vadit et assumit septem alio spiritus secum nequeriore se, et ingresi habit ant ibi. Et fiunt novissima homini silius peora prioribus. Factum est altem, cum heic diceret, ex dolens vocem, queda mulier de torba, dixit ili, beatus venter, qui pe torpa vint, et ubera que succisti. Hatile dixit, qui nime beati, qui audiunt verbum dehi, 
et custodiunt illus. Today is the third Sunday of Lent, and this Mass is being offered for the repose of the soul of Dorothy Scantis. Eternal rest granted to her, O Lord. May she rest in peace. May her soul and all the souls of the faithful departed. Our prayer for vocations. O God, we earnestly beseech thee to bless the church with many priests, brothers, and sisters who will love thee with their whole strength be faithful to their vocation, and gladly spend their entire lives to teach thy truths, serve thy church, and to make thee known and loved. Bless our families, bless our children. O Mary, Queen of the clergy, pray for us. Pray for our priests, seminarians, and religious. Obtain for us many more, amen. The prayer to Our Lady of Perpetual Help in this time of pandemic. O Mother of perpetual help, grant that I may invoke thy powerful name, which is the safeguard of the living and the salvation of the dying. O pure Virgin Mary, let thy name be henceforth ever on my lips. Whenever I call upon thee by name, hasten to help me. When I speak thy sacred name, or even think of thee, what consolation and confidence, what sweetness and emotion fill my soul. I thank God for having given thee so sweet, powerful, and lovely a name for my good. Let my love prompt me to ever greet thee as mother of perpetual help. Maria Mater Ecclesiae et Domina Fatime. We've had a great influx of confessions lately, which is wonderful, but we're running out of time to get them done. Uh, so uh, just remember that, get here early, uh, for confessions. I know Father Hartman goes in at 9.30 and goes all the way through into Mass, and I try to do the same at the early Mass. So uh, when we get to the Triduum, it's going to be very difficult to do that because of everything that else that has to be done. So uh, be conscious of that as you plan. Uh, also, I, I say this especially because we have so many new people here. Uh, it's, it's a shame that you're getting started here through the restrictions that are in place. But uh, maybe it's good because uh, we can only build up from here with these restrictions. But one of the things that happens is at this time of the year is that the readings for Lent become much, much longer than they usually are, especially weekdays. This coming Saturday is the Old Testament story of Susanna, and it's probably the longest epistle of the entire year. It's about five pages in the Missal. Uh, when we have long readings like that, I don't redo them. Like for the Passion, when we do the Passion on Palm Sunday and Good Friday, uh, we would be here for 10 hours instead of five. So I don't reread the readings, but that then be, make, behooves you then to prepare. And one of the things that I think is a great thing about the Old Mass is that because it's in Latin, you have to spend extra time preparing for everything. And when you do, you reap great benefits. And uh, if you read ahead of time the reading, you look at it, uh, and you uh, really get it under your, the story under your, under your belt and in your head, then when it's read in Latin, a lot of words, will, you'll recognize them, and you'll begin to even maybe understand parts of the Latin as it's proclaimed. So that's a good way to prepare uh, to read those stories ahead of time and be ready uh, for that. That's really an important thing. We do have proper sheets, sheets that we put out every week for the changing parts of the Mass during the year. We haven't done that since COVID. Uh, but I really don't like that. Uh, I think that everybody should have their own missile. So I'm also buying a case of missiles that I'm going to bring in and we'll put them up for sale, no profit, just at cost. 
and hopefully people will be able to buy them and I'll give more about a recommendation when that time comes up. So we'll be doing that very soon so that people will have them for Holy Week and can follow along with the rites of Holy Week. A few other things. This uh, Thursday, March the 11th, we begin the Novena to St. Joseph. We have that Novena every year. Uh, we mention St. Joseph every day in the uh, prayers after Low Mass. He's been a great helper of Mater Ecclesiae since the very beginning. We're so glad we have that beautiful statue of him in the sanctuary. So I'm begging you, please, for the sake of Mater, if nothing else, say the Novena to St. Joseph every day. It's in the bulletin. You can take it home with you. The prayers are there. Put it on your refrigerator. Put it on the mirror in the bathroom. Somewhere where you'll see it every day. Put there March 11th, and that way you'll be able to participate every day if you can't come to church with us. On March the 19th, we have the beautiful Solemn Mass in honor of St. Joseph with a beautiful Choral Mass, and that's always been a great tradition too. So if you can, uh, we'll have stations at 7, probably quarter to 7. I'll let you know more next week. And then the Mass at 7.30, as we usually have our evening Masses. Um, do you love sacred music? Oh, yeah. Do you love to sing? Oh, yeah. Have you always thought about uh, joining the Mater Ecclesiae Choir? I wish I could, but I can't, but you can. So if you answered yes to any of the above questions, we encourage you to consider joining the choir. Experience and musical capabilities are a plus, but anyone is welcome to join the choir. And uh, if you want to join, please contact our music director, Guillermo Passaran, who's right back there, and his phone number is in the bulletin, and as well, you can text or call him. Now, uh, you know, the, it would be, you don't have to know how to read music. You just have to be able to find a note. And if you can't, and you're really willing, he'll help you. Uh, so uh, we'll see what we can come up with. But I'm really excited. We're, we were talking the other night. We're planning some big things down the line. Uh, we're going to try to come up with some type of an idea for a yearly fundraiser just for our choir here to have more professional singers come on a more regular basis uh, to really build up the repertoire. There's so much sacred music out there that's magnificent, and life is too short for us not to be doing it every week. So we have to try our best to see what we can do to build that up, and uh, we have some plans which we'll be unveiling. I'm so glad that the, the clouds seem to be lifting, and we'll be able to start over and really get moving with the things we want to do. Um, donations plummeted on February 14th due to the ice storm. So if you weren't here that day and you forgot to give, if you give, you'll be my Valentine. <laughs> and if you want, I'll actually give you a big hug. So uh, that'll be what we, if you can just help us out with that, that would be great. Um, the House of Charity. Uh, we are, our goal is 52,000. I've been asking people to put, send their pledge cards in from the, in the mail. Many have. Uh, our, uh, we have raised to date $22,352, which is 43% of our goal. Uh, that has been raised by 33 parishioners. Um, and so that, that means 8.2% of our parish has given out of 401 families. So I think we can keep going and continue to try to seek the goal. So that's in there, and please take note of that. Um, and I think that's basically it for today. Yes. A lesson from the epistle of blessed Paul the Apostle to the Ephesians. Brethren, be ye followers of God as most dear children, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath delivered himself for us as an oblation and a sacrifice to God for an odor of sweetness. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not so much be as named among you, as becometh saints, or obscenity, or foolish talking, or scurrility, which is of no purpose. But rather, giving thanks, for know you this, and understand that no fornicator, or unclean, or covetous person, which is the serving of idols, hath inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the anger of God upon the children of unbelief. Be ye not therefore partakers with them, for you were heretofore in darkness, but now light in the Lord. Walk then as children of the light, and uh, the light, for the fruit of the light is in all goodness and justice and truth. A continuation of the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke. 
At that time, Jesus was casting out a devil, and the same was dumb. And when he had cast out the devil, the dumb spoke, and the multitudes were in admiration of it. But some of them said, He casteth out devils by Beelzebub, the prince of devils. And others, tempting, asked of him a sign from heaven. But he, seeing their thoughts, said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself shall be brought to desolation, and house upon house shall fall. And if Satan also be divided against himself, how shall his kingdom stand? Because you say that through Beelzebub I cast out devils. Now I cast out devils by Beelzebub, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. But if I, by the finger of God, cast out devils, doubtless the kingdom of God is come upon you. When a strong man armed keepeth his court, those things are in peace which he possesseth. But if a stronger than he come upon him and overcome him, he will take away all his armor wherein he trusted and will distribute his spoils. He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through places without water seeking rest, and not finding it, he saith, I will return into my house whence I came out. And when he is come, he findeth it swept and garnished. Then he goeth and taketh with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and entering in, they dwell there. And the last state of that man becomes worse than the first. And it came to pass, as he spoke these things, a certain woman from the crowd, lifting up her voice, said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore thee, and the paps that gave thee suck. But he said, Yea, rather blessed are they who hear the word of God and keep it. Thus far the words of the Holy Gospel. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. I've decided to suspend for, a, for Lent, at least, the sermons on the virtues. I'll get back to those. Uh, and, uh, but now there's too many things to talk about during Lent that are pertinent to this season. Father Hartman and I have discussed that uh, it's, an, it's a miracle, a beautiful miracle, that so many more people have been coming here for confessions. Not only our own parishioners, they're coming from all over. During the height of the COVID, back in the, in the spring, we had people from North Jersey, from Bayonne, from Jersey City, from uh, Staten Island, as far away as uh, uh, places up in Rareforth, North, North, Northern New Jersey. And we had people from all around here go. There's a parish nearby here that has not really opened up except for one mass since this all started, and they only have confessions by appointment only. We have had confessions every single day, and during the height of it, for an hour every day at least, during the whole thing. And word got out. Word got out through the internet, and people came from all over. And that's a wonderful thing, and we're glad about it. But we also noticed that, that many people who are of goodwill, through no fault of their own, have lost a sense of how to go to confession. Because so many times, in many places, confession is proposed as almost a psychological counseling area where you go to feel better about yourself. And that's not what confession's for. You will feel better about yourself, but not because that's what you're trying to do. So we, I thought that today I would start, and this week and next time I preach, a little bit of a refresher about confession, uh, and to remind, uh, especially those who are new, not to be critical of you in any way, because like I said, it's not your fault, and you're, you have the best of intentions, and you want to do what's right, and you're here for confession, which is a wonderful thing, but to help you maybe a little more to try to understand how to go at a time when nobody talks about it anymore. Nobody in most parishes ever talks about it. So people have lost the art of how to go because they don't understand anymore. And, we, and many times people will go to confession basing their thoughts on feelings, what they felt. And our feelings do not guide us. They can confuse us. Our feelings must be informed by our faith and the truth of the gospel not the other way around. So our feelings could think something is great and it's a great mortal sin, and we could think in our, we could feel that something is, is, is horrible and it's nothing. But only when our feelings are trained by the truth, then we can begin to maybe put some credence in what they're trying to tell us. So I'd like to talk about that just a little bit today in regard to that. But before I do, 
Last time I preached, I gave a little examination of conscience. And I went through the first three commandments, which are about uh, our relationship with God. I often, all through my life as a priest, I've heard people say, oh, Father, I, I, don't, I don't kill anybody. I don't, I don't know why I need to go to confession. I don't really have any sins. Do you go to church on Sunday? No. Well, you're killing your relationship with God. Where does it say that the fifth commandment's more important than the third, than the, 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 the third commandment? Where, 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 where did you come? Well, I feel it is. No, it doesn't matter. Your feelings are wrong. You have to conform yourself to what God has said and what the church teaches, not the other way around. So we have to follow all the commandments. So the last uh, seven are our relationship uh, to each other and in doing so, praising God. The fourth commandment. Have you shown due honor and obedience to your parents, pastors, and other superiors? Your parents, well, when you're up to 18, you have to obey them. After that, you have to show them respect and honor them. And even if there's a difficulty there to try to overcome that, it's on the child to do that, not the parent. And hopefully you can win them around if, they're, if they've drifted away from the faith or they're not practicing the faith anymore. Usually it's the parents of my generation whose kids don't practice. For many of our wonderful young people, they practice, but their parents don't. So we have that, that, we have that problem that you have to work on that. Uh, to obey your pastor in right things when he commands you according to the faith or according to right reason or to proper practice and other superiors, our bosses or so forth. And remember when I talked about obedience, I stressed the fact that we never ever ever have to obey anyone if they're telling us to sin or go against the truth of the gospel or to do anything against God. We must obey God above all else. But our superiors, when they're reflecting him in their proper role, we must obey them. Uh, have you been respectful to aged persons? Uh, you know, it's a common thing sometimes for younger people to make fun of older people. Uh, okay, maybe they do some crazy things, but that's not right. We should have to show respect for those who are elderly. One day we'll be there, and we should remember that. And, and so the, in the ancient times and up until recently, older people were always revered with their, of, because of their wisdom and their experience. And now they're just pushed aside and never even thought of. We can't do that. We have to treat them with respect and even go out of our way to be nice and kind. Have you had proper care for your children and those dependent on you, in particular as regards religious training and duties? So in this commandment, there's also a duty of parents in teaching their children the faith and training them in the practice of that faith. Have you given your children good example? The fifth commandment, have you procured, desired, or hastened the death of anyone, including abortion? Have you procured an abortion, desired one, hastened the death of one, and, or even killed someone or wished someone dead? Have you been guilty of terrible anger, hatred, quarreling, revenge, uh, unjust prejudice, uh, provoking language, insulting words, ridicule, refused to speak to others, caused enmities, which means division and dividing everybody, causing everybody to fight, even given scandal. So the fifth commandment is more than just physically killing someone, even though that's horrible and we should never do it, but it involves all the sins of, against charity, hatred and divisiousness and all those things that really are more common than we think. The sixth and ninth commandments, have you been guilty of impurity or immodesty in thoughts, words, and actions? We'll talk about this a little more with what St. Paul said today. Have you put yourself in an occasion of sin by reading bad books, keeping bad company, attending immoral performances, or looking at the internet, or even things that are neutral but will lead to other things, going toward pornography and all the, the garbage and trash that's on the internet? Have you been an occasion of sin to others by your conversation, your jokes, your dress, your actions? Have you been immodest? The seventh and tenth commandments, have you stolen or retained ill-gotten goods? Stolen, taken them directly, or retained? They're there, nobody says anything, and you keep them. Have you cheated? Have you refused to pay just debts? In other words, you owe somebody something, you could pay them, but you don't, and you put them in a bad light. Damaged or wasted the property of others? Damaging property is a big thing. We don't even realize it sometimes. We have to be aware of other people's property and take care to never, ever damage it in any way. Have we accepted bribes or have we given bribes? 
Have we neglected to make restitution? In other words, when we steal something, we are obliged to be forgiven to restore that and give it back. If we can't give it back, then we give whatever it would cost to charity, to the poor, so that we make up for it and we don't receive any benefit from it. Have we, um, have we helped the poor? Have we coveted what belongs to others to the point of where we hate them? And finally, the Eighth Commandment. Have you borne false witness or a false testimony against another? Have you been guilty of detraction where you spread around things that are true that should not be known to destroy them? Or calumny where you say things to destroy them that aren't true? Have you flattered people unnecessarily when you're really lying? Have you been hypocri a hypocrite, shown hypocrisy by saying for people to do others and telling people they should do other things but you don't do them yourself? Lying and rash judgment. This little paper is what I put near the confessional, and you're welcome to take one. I always keep them with me, uh, and I always have them there. Uh, it's from a book, prayer book from 1925. Now, there might be some modern things that are missing, but human nature never changes. And it's a good thing to have. We don't have to use it every time we go to confession, but we can use it maybe a few times a year. I always tell people to go to confession. I used to, if, you don't, if you're not guilty of mortal sin, go at least four times a year during Lent and Advent when we're wearing purple and during uh, uh, the Memorial Day and Labor Day to spread it out evenly for venial sin. But I just heard a better one today. It's time to go to confession when you need a haircut. That reminds you, I better get back to going. Now, some people, it might take a little longer than others, but it is a good little rule of thumb to, to do that for venial sin as well. So confession is important, and, it's, and we can do this especially during Lent and Advent, to really go in and examine our conscience maybe a little more thoroughly, remind ourselves of things, and also it's good for a particular examine where you, know, you might be living a pretty good life, you're not committing mortal sin, but what are one of the venial sins you'd like to work on? So you pick one of those, and you say, that's going to be the thing I'm going to work on this week. And I'm going to examine my conscience every day specifically on that one action and see how I've done, how I prevented myself from falling into it. Or maybe it's a much more serious temptation. How can I every day dwell just on that thing to see how I can make it better? And this can remind us of some of those things we need to do. Now, getting back to confession in general, St. Paul talks about today all these sins, fornication, uh, covetousness, uh, enmities, scurrility, all the divisions which I just talked about, the things that we're tempted to, and that can drag us down. And he says, somebody who perseveres in those cannot receive the kingdom of heaven. Our Lord says in the gospel that Beelzebub will try to go in and divide. And he proves that he is God because Beelzebub can't destroy himself and divide his kingdom. Christ came to get him out. But he warns us, if one devil has left, be prepared because if you clean it out or soul out, and you don't protect yourself, seven worse ones could come in and destroy you. And that's something. We must, we must obey God above all things. We must love God above all things and keep his commandments. The two go together. So in order to do that, we have to know what sin is. Now, for many of us, we know this. It might be a little review. For some who haven't heard these things for a while, it's a good thing to be instructed in. And that is that the church has always taught that there's a difference in sin. Sin isn't just sin. Uh, that's a very Protestant idea, that just sin is sin. There's no such thing as serious sin or evil, small sins. It's just sin in general. For Catholics, we believe there's a, a, a difference in, in what sin is. There's mortal sin and there's venial sin. Mortal sin is deadly sin. It kills God's life in us. It takes away sanctifying grace. If we are living in mortal sin we, and die in mortal sin, we will not go to heaven. So it is very, very serious. Well, how do we know what's, what sin is mortal? There's three things you always have to remember. The first, grave matter. It's really serious. Well, how do you know it's grave matter? Because the church teaches us what grave matter is. It's grave matter to miss Mass on Sunday for no reason uh, for, at all. It's grave matter to have an abortion. It's grave matter to steal something that's important or expensive from someone. It's grave matter to, uh, to never pray to God. It's grave matter to take God's name in vain in a cursing, horrible way. They're all grave matter. So the church teaches us what grave matter is. Now, the next thing is we have to know that it's grave. 
We have to be taught that this is grave matter. And so part of the job of the priest is to teach that, and that's the job of parents, to teach their children what grave matter is, what is to be avoided, what is really bad, what you have to go to confession to before you would ever go back to communion. You don't go to communion with grave matter on your soul if you've committed a mortal sin. So it's grave matter, you have to know it's grave matter, and then you have to fully consent. You have to say, I don't care. I don't care that it's grave matter. I don't care that it destroys God's life in me. And you don't even have to be knowledge of that. You just do it because you don't care. Then you've committed a mortal sin. All right? Now, if it's not grave matter, then what is it? It's a venial sin. If, it's, if you don't know the gravity of it, nobody ever told you, then are you committing a mortal sin? No, because you have to know. If you had a hunch, maybe. If you know, yes. And that's why, when in doubt, you confess it anyhow. And then the priest can help you sort out whether you really understood that or not. And then full consent of the will, did, were you, did you do it by force or fear? Did somebody push you into it? Did you not even think about it? That might lessen the culpability or the responsibility for the sin, but it's still a mortal sin in its material aspect and needs to be confessed. So a mortal sin is not about feelings. It's about uh, serious things. And when we confess a mortal sin, even to this day, it's still the teachings of the church, we have to confess it in kind and number. Kind means you say what it is. You call a spade a spade. You don't go in after you've committed adultery 50 times and say, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. I've done some impure things. Well, what does that mean? It doesn't mean adultery, does it? So when we say it in kind, it's almost like a lance, lancing a boil to get the pus out. We hear ourselves say it. And it's a horrible thing, and we think to ourselves, I can't believe I have to say this of myself. We are, the, we are the accusing attorney, accusing ourselves before the throne of God, and we're begging his mercy because we're being so honest. And in being so honest, it helps us to heal because we don't like the sound of what we just said. So we say what it is, and then kind and number how many times we've committed it since our last confession. That's... Uh, a real nasty thing. So suppose you were into some type of sin like fornication and you stopped and you've really been doing good and you fell once and it's been like two months and you go to confession and you say to the priest, Father, I committed the sin of fornication. Well, he doesn't know how many, is that, is, are you trying to do better? Are you, are you getting improved or not? So he says, one time since my last confession two months ago. Okay, well then you're trying. You're striving to do better. You've got to double down again. Don't let yourself slip, so forth. Suppose someone comes to confession and says, in the last two months I've committed this sin of 25 times. Well, this is a different situation. He doesn't, this person's really not trying to overcome it, are they? So they need different direction and maybe a firmer hand to get them out of that habit. And so that's why it's necessary for the priest to know the kind, what type of sin it is by name, as nasty as that might be, and the number, how many times since my last confession. Now, venial sin is, it's, it's sin, but it's not grave matter. It's maybe white lies, smaller things we do, but the difference with venial sin is this, that there are some venial sins that are just done out of carelessness. Like somebody says something and you, you give them a white lie back, and you don't even think about it, it just happened. Well, that's wrong, it's, you should ask God's forgiveness, but it's not a serious thing that's leading anywhere. But suppose you tell white lies all the time and you intentionally tell them. Well, then that's what's wrong. Your intention is to not tell the truth. It may not be grave matter, but it's still wrong and you're getting yourself into a habit of doing this that will eventually lead to grave matter because you're loosening your defenses as time goes on. So there is unintentional venial sin, which is basically weakness. And then there's intentional venial sin where you know what you're doing and you continue to do it even and you don't try to stop yourself. That's why when we confess venial sins, we should not just confess the sin. We don't have to give it a number and kind. Uh, we don't have to give it a number, but we should say what it is, the kind. But what's the motive behind it? Why do I do these things? So if you're telling a lot of white lies, why am I, why am I doing that? Is it to make myself look better? Well, that's pride. Is it, to, is it to, uh, to spare telling another person the truth that they need to hear? Well, then that's uh, a lack of respect for them and courage. And so we could go on and on why we do those things. So that's where I'm going to end today. But one last thing I want to say is that next time when I finish this, 
I'm going to talk about some things that St. Francis de Sales has to say about this in the introduction to the devout life. And he'll talk about uh, how, uh, no matter how small a sin is, we must try to confess it honestly, uh, make no superfluous accusations, which I'll talk about, that's rampant today, um, that way that we, we must, um, we, we, when we examine our conscience, we have to be realistic and try once in a while to really go in depth, that we should not content ourselves with confessing our venial sins merely as to fact, but why we did what we did. That is so very important. Um, our Lord has given us a great gift. Nobody that's sick really wants to go to the doctor and get a shot. Nobody wants to have to go into the emergency room if they're, if they're bleeding. Uh, they'd rather be home at comfortable. But you do it because you have to do it. You've got to get better. And you know that when you do it, even though there's sacrifice and pain, you're going to be better after that and you'll be back to normal. Well, confession's the same thing. Nobody loves it. It's not a lot of fun. It's not easy. And sometimes it's painful. But when you do it, it is like going to the emergency room and you get that shot that you need to overcome whatever it is that's causing the problem and it heals you so that you can continue on to live the life that God has called you to. We must love God above all things, but we must do what he has commanded us as well. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, amen. Oh, Lord. 
Biscoco e peccatori possono. Per omnia secula seculorum. Amen. Oremus, precepti salutaribus moniti, et divina institutio de formati, audemus dicere, pater noster qui es in celis, Sanctifice tohor nohomen tuhum, adveniat regnum tuhum, fiat voluntas tuha, sicut in cielo et in terra, panem nostrum quotidianum da nobis hodie, et dimite nobis debita nostra, Sicut et nos dimitimus debitoribus nostris, et ne nos inducas in tentationem.
Heronia secula seculorum. Amen. Pax Domini sit semper vobiscum. Et cum spiritu tuo. Misuriatur vestri omnipotens Deus, et dimisis peccatis vestris per ducat vols ad vitam eterna. Indulgentiam absolutionem et remissionem peccatorum nostrorum tribuat nobis omnipotens et misericors dominus. Ecce agnus Dei, ecce qui tolit facata mondi. Domine, non sentite, sudit versi sacrimene, se tanti di terra e al senato trovano in me. Domine, non sentite, sudit versi sacrimene, se tanti di terra e al senato trovano in me. Domine, non sentite, sudit versi sacrimene, se tanti di terra e al senato trovano in me.
Sobus Domine, reatibus et pericolis propitiatus absolve, quos tanti misterii tribuis esse participes, per Dominum nostrum Iesum Christum Filium Tuum, qui tecum vivid et regnat in unitate Spiritus Sancti Deus, per omnia secula seculorum. Dominus Fobiscum, et con Spiritu Tua, benedicamus, Domino. Benedicat vos omnipotens Deus, Pater et Filius et Spiritus Sanctus. Amen. Dominus Vos. In Isus Sancti Evangelii secundum Luana. In principio erat verbum, et verbum erat apodeum, et Deus erat verbum. Erat in principio apodeum, omnia per ipso facto sunt, et sine ipso facto mes, nido quo facto mes. In ipso vita erat, et vita erat vos omnipotens, et lux in tenebris nicet, et tenebre eum, et incomprehenderit. Domnisus adeo cum in nomine erat Ioannis, si venit in testimonium, o testimonium peri bere di lumine, o domnis credere in quelle lume, non erat ili lux ed o testimonium peri bere di lumine, ego lux vero quel illuminato, omine veniente meno mondo, in mondo erat, in mondo spedibus in fatus est, in mondo seiam non condomine, in proprio veni del sui e in nome recepevunt, quod quod atum recepevunt, e in nome di rispondi stata filius dei fieri, iscopevunt in nomine, qui non ex ambulibus, ne quei ex voluntate caris, ne quei ex voluntate miris ed ex Deo notis. Ne quei ex voluntate miris ed ex Deo notis. Ne quei ex voluntate miris ed ex Deo notis. Ne quei ex voluntate miris ed ex Deo notis. Ne quei ex voluntate miris ed ex Deo notis.
most holy, O sacrament divine. All praise and all thanksgiving be every one of O sacrament most holy, O sacrament divine. All praise and all thanksgiving be every one of O sacrament most holy, O sacrament divine. All praise and all thanksgiving be every one of O cor Jesus sacratissimo, miserere nobis. Cor Jesus sacratissimo, miserere nobis. Cor Jesus sacratissimo, miserere nobis. Cor Maria. Sancte Joseph, patrone noster dilectissime. Blessed be God. Blessed be God. Blessed be His holy name. Blessed be His holy name. Blessed be Jesus Christ, true God and true man. Blessed be Jesus Christ, true God and true man. Blessed be the name of Jesus. Blessed be the name of Jesus. Blessed be His most sacred heart. Blessed be His most sacred heart. Blessed be His most precious blood. Blessed be His most precious blood. 
Blessed be Jesus in the most holy sacrament of the altar. Blessed be Jesus in the most holy sacrament of the altar. Blessed be the Holy Spirit, the Paraclete. Blessed be the Holy Spirit, the Paraclete. Blessed be the great Mother of God, Mary most holy. Blessed be the great Mother of God, Mary most holy. Blessed be her holy and immaculate conception. Blessed be her holy and immaculate conception. Blessed be her glorious assumption. Blessed be her glorious assumption. Blessed be the name of Mary, Virgin and Mother. Blessed be the name of Mary, Virgin and Mother. Blessed be St. Joseph, her most chaste spouse. Blessed be St. Joseph, her most chaste spouse. Blessed be God and his angels and in his saints. Blessed be God and his angels and in his saints. May the heart of Jesus in the most blessed sacrament be praised for the love with great affection at every moment in all the tabernacles of the world, even until the end of time. 